Hello and welcome to week 23's gameplay episode. Uh, we'll get through our regulars. First of all, we've got Japes back on. Hello, Air Japes, foot legend. Thank you much, Ben. And not just a foot legend, just coming off of my second 20 and 0. So pretty peach, Ooh. pretty chuffed. Right, whatever the whatever the word that you guys you guys use in the UK, chuffed is right, right? I'm not sure about peached. Is that, yeah. is that a US thing, or did you just make that up? Uh, I think people say it. Maybe the the listeners are gonna be like, nah, people don't really say that. I think some <laughs> say it here. We'll find out. I'm quite pleased with myself at the yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah, you should be. You should be. And we've also got Josh XLS. Hello. Yes, thank you. Um, things are pretty peached over here as well. Got my eleven wins again, so I'm <laughs> delighted with that. Uh, I thought in the US it was normally impeached, but uh, oh. we'll move on to uh, our final guest on this podcast, and that is Alex B. Of course, formerly the FIFA analyst, been on the podcast quite a few times. Always a good guest. Plenty of gameplay tips, so no pressure. Alex, hello and welcome. Yeah, thank you for having me on again, and I'm feeling nice and peachy today. Same as Japes. Yeah, see, it sounds nice. Yeah, it sounds good. And Alex, you almost can make it because your your dogs were what being groomed. What kind of dogs? So I have two Siberian Huskies. Um, so oh, basically, a lot of fur. yeah, it's, you Hoover every day, and it's just an endless battle. So they have to get groomed to keep themselves looking nice and nice and fresh. That's a lot of fur. Yeah, well, and from fur to things you prefer, there are plenty of people out there asking us questions about controller settings or camera settings are the best to go with is there anything you've changed i guess sort of relatively recently that you feel is worth noting people might want to look at themselves first of all we've just got to address that absolutely terrible terrible uh, reference from you there from the fur to the prefer but hey we'll carry on <laughs> <laughs> in terms of that's what I'm here for terrible yeah, links in terms of what do I change and what do I like I think first of all visual if we're talking camera settings the, the way I always kind of explain it is co-op or telebroadcast tend to be the kind of go-to for a lot of people sometimes tele as well co-op is very good if you want to try and see the whole pitch it can make the game almost feel a little bit slower just because you're so far away from the action the dribbling doesn't seem as tight and as quick and smooth co-op can be good for people that want to see the whole pitch but it can actually also work against them where it can be they've got so much information to take in and so many runners to track and see that it can actually be an overload of information so that is something to take into account with co-op it's actually also harder to score as well because the goals are basically smaller so you have to be a little bit more precise uh, with your analog stick so that is something to also think about but it's good if you want to try and play, let's say, quote unquote football. Telebroadcast is definitely better if you want to be a little bit more closer to the action. Maybe if you're a bit more of a skill or dribbling sort of player, you do have to go to the mini map more though to obviously try and make sure you're spotting any runners or, or anything that may be a threat. In terms of preference, do I have a preference on the camera? No, I think for recording and, and coaching and kind of teaching people, co-op's good because you can just highlight things so much easier. But in terms of actual just, you know, wanting to get down and play, I think telebroadcast is also a preference of mine. I tend to switch between the two. If you ever come into my stream and you see me randomly switching camera, that's because I'm tilted and I'm blaming the camera at that point. So I'm looking at something else. Uh, so, so that's kind of what it is with visual. I did mention on a previous uh, podcast with yourselves about how I think precision shooting, which was semi last year, mm. is so good and... For people that aren't the most mechanical inside the 18-yard box, I think that's something that people definitely will want to look at. So maybe they can go and check that episode back out. But the big thing for me, which I changed to at the start of this year because it was new, and I think by now most people are on it, but I don't know. Maybe you guys can say as well, is advanced defending. Tactical defending is what you know, kind of the default is. And the reason why I think advanced defending is so good is because it gives you the ability to basically look for the shoulder barge. So when you're shoulder to shoulder with someone down on the byline, you can just hold X or A, and just shoulder barge people off the ball and you can't do, really do that with tactical defending because you have to press the tackle button sometimes you get a pull of the shirt sometimes you get a shoulder barge sometimes you get a tackle advanced defending for me is just so clear in so many different areas for people so that would kind of be the, the big one for me if people aren't on that already quickly on the camera settings yeah. if you are bad at defending in like one-on-one -on -one scenarios like defending players that dribble quite frequently you should play telebroadcast yeah like co-op is much, much harder to defend in one-on-one -on -one scenarios, in my opinion. So I, I would encourage people that if you're struggling in those situations, you don't have to do the fully like zoomed out telebroadcast either, because it's gonna, it's gonna, it's just a lot easier to defend. I know I struggled quite a bit when I tried out co-op this year in those one-on-one -on -one defending situations. 
And I went back to telebroadcast and everything got better for me. I was like, oh, I am an okay defender. Thank goodness. Yeah, that's interesting. And actually, Josh, I don't know whether you've ever said what camera settings you use on the pod. I don't think I have, but I'm a, I'm co-op through and through. And I mm. can play on other, like telebroadcast is probably the one that I would switch to if I was to switch. But I really like being able to see the other side of the field for kind of big switches of play, especially for because I, I really like my R1 squares over the top to the other side of the field. So I'm not great at reading the minimap quickly enough in order to do that. So mm. it's also just like a force of habit where I've, I've played on co-op probably for about a decade now. I can't stop myself. Yeah. Are you on max height and zoom? I think I am. And if not, I'm just on default. Mm. If I if I change things, it's usually to max height and minimum zoom, as in like as zoomed out as possible. That makes sense. I don't know if I'm uh, strange for this, but they introduced a new setting called penalty box zoom. And I've found that it's meant that I feel I can get the best of both co-op and telebroadcast now, whereas before I would often switch between the two, kind of unsure which one I actually preferred because I do like to dribble, um, but I was aware that I was sort of missing longer passes because I was playing telebroadcast. So basically what I do is I'm on co-op. I've got max height, uh, most zoomed out you can be, but have max penalty box zoom. And what that does is just, well, as it says, increases the zoom once you get to the penalty boxes at each end, hmm. which gives you that you know, tighter dribbling uh, view when you are at the, the business ends of the pitch. It makes a lot of sense. I'd buy that. Um, so I'd give that a go if, if people are interested in, in trying something different with their cameras. It takes a bit of getting used to. It's not quite as aggressive as the power shot zoom, but it, it is kind of along those lines. It, it, you definitely want to have power shot zoom off when doing this because the zoom of both at the same time is is quite dangerous so <laughs> avoid that at all costs um but yeah it's something that it might be worth a try doing and yeah a good point because you, you mentioned precision shooting before alex and it's something that i actually was chatting to well people know he's been on the podcast taz one of the key men behind the guide and he was saying that it's something that he's used the entire cycle um, but one thing he mentioned actually which was quite interesting i wonder whether you might agree with this he was saying it actually probably would be more popular at the pro level, but because they've been competing since so early in the season, none of them have actually had the time to try it because it is a really long kind of adjustment process that would hurt you if you're playing competitively constantly. Yeah, in a way. I mean, it was it was really strong last year and then they buffed it a little bit more uh, this year, basically mm. because of pro feedback. Uh, and I think my opinion on why pros don't run it is just more so that they're so quick inside the 18-yard box that they're constantly moving the left stick with their dribbling and the skill moves and whatnot. So you have basically have to snap your left analog stick. You could be facing almost your own goal, and then you've got to quickly snap your left analog stick to go on target. And obviously, those fine margins is that if you're slightly off, it will go wide. It, it goes where you aim, right? So mm. it makes it a lot more difficult for pros. Where in those, you know, moments where you just need that little bit of assistance, you can't really rely on it. But then obviously, the, the con to it is that. A pro could, you know, be in the right position, everything's looking right, and then they just randomly still put it wide and assisted shooting. So it definitely is that. I just more so think it is just a case of how mechanically gifted, you know, those sort of players are and what they have to do inside the 18-yard box to generate half a yard to get the shot off. They just can't run the risk of accidentally putting it wide on precision. Mm, yeah, that's a fair point. Because I guess one of the big things to warn people is if it's a narrow angle, whereas with assisted, it's basically a guaranteed goal if the keeper's not there. It's yeah. very hard to score with precision in those circumstances. Yeah, exactly. The, the, the more narrower the angle, you know, if you say go for a corner and you play it short and you go for those like crazy Travella angles where it's like you're basically almost in line with a goal, it's actually just impossible to even go for that on precision shooting. Mm. So again, there's certain areas where it's like a pro just needs to, to be able to get that sort of shot off and they just won't be able to do it on precision. So it is very much down to play style, but I think that's, you know, one of the big reasons why pros don't run it. I do wonder if with the nerf of Travella, whether you we might see a pro try it in an event because I feel like that was that was my biggest knock on precision shooting was that from distance, especially from like an angle distance, whether it be the finesse shots at the beginning of the game or then the Travellas afterwards, I was nowhere near as consistent 
as I was with just assisted shooting. And I wonder if, with it being nerfed, if that will now change, because there was a lot of Travellers being scored in the pro events. Yeah, I think I've heard that complaint a lot where people say they find it harder to score like finesses and Travellers on like normal angles. And I actually think it just comes down to practice. I find you get so much more like side net in Travellers and finesses where the keeper just has no chance because no it's chance. so yeah, so yeah. much more delicate to where you're aiming. But obviously where it also got the buff this year is that any cutbacks inside the six-yard box basically takes off precision shooting and puts on assisted shooting. And that was something that the devs, you know, mm. it, it put in because of pro feedback. So they did that and they thought, yeah, you know, pros are going to use this more and they're going to get, you know, a, a lot more reliable shots and they're going to be happy. But it just simply wasn't enough. So I don't know. I think, I just think for pros, when you're, when you're at that level, those fine margins that it's really hard to take, oh, I missed that shot because I quickly snapped my left analog stick and it went wide rather than, I was on assisted shooting, I was aiming wide, but then the RNG just came in. I think that's kind of where, where it goes. So it's definitely, I don't know, it's an interesting one. Maybe some pro will do it in the future if they're not as mechanically, you know, reliable inside the 18-yard box. They don't, you know, need that as much. Maybe someone that goes for crosses a bit more, mm. shoots from range, they might be able to get away with it. But I just think too many pros are just, just too good on the sticks, basically. Yeah, it's funny. I was going to transition us on to uh, something you just mentioned, which is crossing settings. What are your... Uh, settings for crossing do you have it on semi assisted fully assisted i run mine on semi oh, okay interesting I, th I think uh i ran mine on semi from fifa 21 where you used to do r1 square it was where you just like full power it and it would just yeet into the box but you needed to be on semi to get it to work um ever since then i've run it I, I just just that's what i prefer just to have that little bit more control and a little bit more accuracy based off you know your power just take a little while to get used to, though. Yeah, and the advantage is that you can sort of aim it more at a specific player, is that right? Or to a specific area, whereas assisted is basically just going to pick for you to some extent. Yeah, your your power is definitely more, you know, you have to be more delicate on it based on where you want it to go. I do find sometimes the German crosses can be a little bit difficult with them to get them right. But when you're running assisted, what I used to find sometimes is that you'd look for a German cross and it just wouldn't pick out the one that you want. It would either go further or shorter. And that's where like, you know, the, the semi kind of comes in for me. I just think for most people, when when you are running it, you've got to be kind to yourself with it because your power is so delicate and obviously where you're aiming is such a big thing that if you've got three players, one at the front post, one at the penalty spot and one at the back post, they're actually so close to one another when you really think about it in terms of the power bar. So it takes a lot of time to get used to, you know, exactly who you want it to go to. But it is easier to pick out that middleman than it would be unassisted. I think I play on assisted. Interesting, yeah. yeah well, I, I just think it's like a uh, you got to figure out how it works. But also, I don't send many players into the box, so I'm like, mm, okay, yeah, yeah. I want it to either be like front post or back post. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, I, I don't know, I ever put that many in. Yeah, I guess if it's only ever going to really target the player you want to head it, then that's not really an issue being assisted, is it? So, yeah, I will occasionally. I do send it. I do definitely still hold it too long, and it goes like all the way. Like all the way to the back post. Mm, yeah, yeah, I think a, a way where people can get around it as well to make it a bit better for them is player lock to the player that you want it to cross to, and then all you have to do is basically just press square, and then it will just go to exactly to who you're on. So that can be a way to kind of get around sometimes crosses not going where you want. Player lock, get on the player that you want, press square, bang, you, you've got it. Here's a question about that. Actually, when are you doing the player lock? Because obviously theoretically it should make it easier for your opponent to take the ball off the player who's going to cross it but I guess you're doing it quite quickly because you're quite used to it but are there specific parts of the pitch that you think uh, here I can do it the big time for me is I don't like <laughs> I don't like player lock crosses on what I call whippy whippies so think about like you bend it like Beckham <laughs> you know where you're really getting a lot on it getting a lot of curve you whippy whippy yeah you're you whippy whippy I don't like them that when you want a lofty lofty where you want to put it up high and you do an L1 square that's where the player lock uh, is better for me so if I'm player locking it's when I've run to the byline the opponent's really worried about me drilling it off across and you know looking for that sweat off across basically which gives you you know a second or so on the ball precious analog six in it should just be muscle memory where you want to go to. So I know I have to basically 12 o'clock switch to go to like Lukaku, who's at right forward, who's at back post. And then I just input L1 square, it lofts it up and then power header, you know, bang, goal. If I'm wanting to go for like a German cross, then that's when I, I tend to less do the play a lot. The only other time I'll do a play a lot there is if say you've got your attacker just on the edge of the D and their right centre back, because say if we've got the ball on the bottom side of the screen, 
and we're going to whip it in with our left foot. Their right centre-back has come over slightly, so there's a bit of a gap between the right centre-back and the left centre-back. That's when you can play a lot to just ask for that square ball to basically go in between that gap. And that's where someone having like whipped pass, for example, then makes that so much better. Yeah, I was going to say, if you thought Japes was a crosser, uh, Alex is, is built different in this department. Oh, I love it. And actually, I was going to say, uh, you should tell people your front three because uh, anyone who likes crossing will be getting very excited by that. <laughs> if I could have Team Lee Harland, I would, but I've got him on loan, so I don't, know, I don't have the full one. <laughs> but uh, the winter wildcard, Drogba, and then Thunderstruck Lukaku, because again, I'm not spending the money on the new Lukaku, and then that new future star Xerxes that's come out. So if you just run three big men, it makes the game nice and simple. What's your build-up on? Balanced and direct passing. You know, still, I still try and play football basically when I come out and if I'm being pressed, it's say L1 square into one of the three big men just to knock it down and kind of build up from there. But I rely heavily so much on me triggering runners, bringing players short, creative runs, player locks that the tactics in itself almost just doesn't matter because of just how much I trigger runners essentially. Mm, interesting. But you still do have direct passing on so because that does generate more yes. runs, right? Or is that just to force the opponent back a bit? Force the opponent back so then if you don't want to look to kind of work towards a byline and go for the cross, you can like back off on the edge and look for a Traveller, Finesse, Power Shot, drill it into one of the big men who can hold it up. Yeah, it gives you a little bit of flexibility to, to do as you please almost. Yeah, and actually talking about build-up, I did want to ask about the patch that we've recently had, which we found out did affect cutbacks on next gen. Uh, so we'll talk about that just after this break. Hello and welcome back after the break. So uh, we had this patch recently and we talked about it on the last podcast. It hadn't actually come out at that point, um, but we spoke about what was coming, mainly a Traveller nerf, but there was also this patch note that got removed saying something about how uh, cutbacks were going to be less effective because of changes to defensive AI. The defensive AI would basically drop deeper and also mark better. This didn't seem to be relevant to old gen, and that's why it wasn't in the pitch note, but actually it has been added on next gen. So that means that if you're playing on PS5, on Xbox Series X or S, or on PC, you may have noticed this change to cutbacks. And I was interested to know whether this had been something people had noticed. Uh, Alex, let's start with you then. Did you spot a change over this weekend? I think where it's different now is you, before in the past, could probably byline drive and look for a cutback even when the, the box is pretty packed and it's like the defensive AI just didn't know where to go. Well, it's now it's more so you can do it when you've essentially got an extra man or when you're kind of catching them, you know, with a few defenders out of position. If you're just trying to drive into the 18-yard box when there's like seven or eight players there, then the defensive AI is slightly better. But I'm at a place where, again, the way I rely on cutbacks, more so maybe than some others, is that, when I get to the byline, I play a lock to the back post, move the attacker ahead of the defender, basically, and then just drill it off across. And then it, it doesn't really matter about the defensive AI then because you're just moving it anyway. So I still think that, you know, they're very good. I think the Travellers as well, if you green time them, I still think they're a viable thing to do. I, I think they've made the patch like a a decent level where they've not nerfed it into the ground where you can't go for either one of those two things now but they've not made it so there's no change whatsoever. I think the patch is kind of okay. Yeah, it's interesting actually. We were saying last week, and I don't think anyone particularly disagreed on that podcast, that they've actually done a fairly solid job of patches this cycle, that they haven't been too strong. They've got them kind of in the right place where they've changed things, but not so much that you couldn't do what they were patching at all. Mm, I think I've been fairly happy with their approach this year in the sense of, I think they've really tried to hold off on some things rather than just going, oh, panic, 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 let's nerf this, nerf this. And then people, and then it's like, well, actually, if you gave it a couple of weeks or a month, like it might not have been as bad as we originally first thought. They have been a little bit more reluctant to just change things massively. And when they have done them, sometimes you've gone, I don't really know it's all too much of a change, you know? Like, so I think that, that's good in a way. I think the only, my gripe, I would argue, with a lot of patches is that it's always to like, Making the attacking worse, you know? Like it's always, mm. oh, we're going to nerf this in the attack, nerf this in the, in, in the attack, and then you look at some of the defence, and it's like, okay, well, Van Dyke still just flies out of nowhere to get a block in, and it's like, mm, could we look at that? But no, they don't, they don't really tend to touch on that too much. But yeah, I think overall, they've done a very good job with not changing all too much throughout the year. Yeah, what about you, James? Any particular thing to note in terms of cutbacks that you've spotted? Um, no. I don't think so. 
like it, it just the extra pass works really really well when you're using direct passing and I didn't use direct passing a lot during the cycle I've been using it since I switched to this 451 and it just means that I oftentimes have a player that's kind of like overlapping I wouldn't call it necessarily like a direct I don't use like a direct cutback cutback I tend to just do more of like that extra pass which is essentially a cutback it just is like a little bit different I don't know yeah it's interesting actually there's been mixed reviews in terms of whether people have noticed much of a difference. Jake Kell says, the game hasn't felt meaningfully different and my win rate has remained stable. Keepers seem to be letting in some more dribblers and spilling the ball as I wasn't on the bleeding edge of the Travella cutback use. It's hard for me to speak, but I suppose I've conceded a few less cutbacks than before. Not a meaningful difference for me though. Um, Josh, have you noticed much of a difference? Yeah, just generally actually post-patch. I mean, other than Travellers and other than the cutback, I, I, it's kind of like the unthinking cutback. It's the one where you just get to the byline and R1 exit and just hope it hits a player rather than like actually having a bit of patience and waiting for the opportunity to kind of open up or waiting for a defender to commit. Like, I, I feel like those maybe have been reduced, but... Other than that, not really. And I often think that the responses to patches are usually kind of because, because you know, something has changed. Anything that happens, whether it's like by 5 or 10% more, is like, oh, the patch must have changed that. Whereas it might just be that the probabilities have fallen that it's happening more this week than it was last week. And next week you'll go, oh, they've changed it again. You know, I've not noticed keepers be any different. Like, the, it's... It's more the angle of trailers. I saw a lot of videos on Twitter of people going, oh, Travellers were patched. And it was like, yeah, in the same way Finesse Shot Plus was patched, where you can still score really good Finesse Shots from distance, from interesting angles. If you green it, have space, put it at the right angle. like Yeah, have a Playstyle Plus. And have the Playstyle Plus. But the... Travellers, you can still score really nice Travellers if it makes sense in the situation to do it. Yeah. You just can't loop one from a ridiculous angle over an entire defense anymore. Good. Like, that's a good change. Yeah. I will echo Alex's sentiment, though, that it, it is frustrating that you don't get buffs to defending, you get nerfs to attacking. And I feel like even the cutback one, it's an AI buff, which I don't mind too much. But I would, the tackle backs, the triple tackle tax uh, is, it is a frustrating element of the game, but I think the alternative would be worse. I think it's one of those cases of being careful what you wish for. Yeah, there are certainly some situations where you should have the ball as you come away from, like if you make a good tackle and you should be able to take the ball away. But I don't think every time you make a tackle that puts your foot on the ball, you should automatically come away with it. I think that would create a horrible game personally. I, I think that the tricky part with buffing defensive AI or gameplay is like, I would personally much rather have the game feel more open than give people more assistance defensively. Like I, I think the when I think about what can you buff, like what levers are there to buff defensively to make it like instead of changing the attacking AI, like a lot of, or instead of changing like attacking mechanics specifically, because a lot of these are mechanics. It's like the cutback one is the first kind of like AI oriented one, mm. but like the finesse, the Travella, like that's all mechanical buffs. And buffing defensive AI makes me so nervous because I still remember plenty of games where people just take their DM and you just sit yep. and don't do any type of manual defending. And I would rather see the mechanic change attacking wise than see the defensive buff that way. I just want to clarify. I, I wasn't pushing for defensive uh, buffs. I wanted defensive mm. nerfs. <laughs> we talked about this last week and we're saying I don't think the cutbacks are a huge issue really you know which one is a problem for me ben it's not i don't know if i don't know if ea qualifies it as a cutback but it's the one where it's the with the fullback and the fullback hits this like insane driven pass to the striker and the striker like catches it in stride and my defender like doesn't like can't seem to do anything with it yeah Th those are the ones that i i struggle with 
Because I'm like, what am I? What am I actually supposed to do in this situation? Yeah. The the interesting thing, I definitely noticed the defensive AI pulling further back towards the goal when you get to the byline. That is really noticeable. I think uh, I tried some cutbacks from that position myself, and it did seem like those were getting crowded out. But the interesting thing, and this is actually a bit more realistic, I guess, is that that means there's more space on the edge of the box now. So if you get into that cutback position on the byline, and typically you've been pulling it into the penalty area for you know the tap-in from there, actually if you can pull it out further, maybe even dink it to the edge of the box, if you have maybe a, a midfield player set to stay on the edge of the box who's going to hang out around the area and can shoot, then you do get nice opportunities from that position now which is something people can maybe look to exploit and actually feels a lot more natural because when a player gets to the byline inevitably and you will see it all the time in any uh, real football match the, the defenders do push quite far into the box to try and cut out the cutback and often there's just a player free on the edge of the box to take a shot so that's definitely something that people could try if they want to uh, I guess score goals against deep defenses but yeah in general I think it's a bit of a shame because I felt like this cycle, people didn't really complain about people dropping back generally, and it felt like that had become something that was not considered that viable, whereas now I think there is probably going to be, at least temporarily, while people work out how to find their way through it, uh, maybe more of a tendency to be happy about setting up deep, or, or at least allowing the, the attacking player to come onto you. But it's worth remembering that actually if a defence is set in the box, if you pull it out and work it back through your midfield, that defense will push up to vacate the box a bit more and you can kind of try again to catch the defense out and there's no harm in doing that and keeping the ball. Let's now move into talking about JHL 451. I mentioned last week that people may want to send in squads so that you can advise on people playing players in certain different positions in the system because it is somewhat unique I guess in the way that it moves players around David M here was saying that he was struggling with it and this is his team so up top he has Eusebio and then he has team of the year best at left attacking mid team of the year sour at right attacking mid team of the year Ribery at left mid winter wild cards Martinelli at right mid thunderstruck De Jong at centre mid and then his defences Davies Van Dijk Bright and Cafu so yeah, I get the sense from knowing this formation myself, he may have got things a little bit the wrong way around there. The first thing that jumps out to me actually is that Martinelli is very ill-suited for the position that he's in. Like in the, in the way that I set this up, I use my best passer, which is the UCL Kimmich card, mm. as my right midfielder because that, that player operates as your true kind of distribution going forward. And I like Martinelli is is not that card. And so De Jong is also your best passer, which I would maybe argue you, it would be better to have somebody that is a little bit more defensive oriented. Like I don't, I don't use Vieira or I use Vieira in that role. I don't use him that often to progress the ball, though he does like kind of okay at it. He doesn't have the same passing range as like Kimmich does or the ability to ping a pass or hit a long pass. Vieira has like some okay passing traits, but he's there to sit back, cut possession out. He's a medium high work rate player. De Jong is high medium. So if I was looking at this squad, like completing Bruno is great. I think Bruno in that Kimmich role will be phenomenal. I still think you're missing a true defensive minded player in there and you you have like you just have to get Martin Ellie out of the squad in that role. He he can't do it. Yeah. You know, that's kind of the rub, I would guess, first blush. Yeah. And also doesn't that player end up as one of the two central midfielders on defense? Yep. Your right mid will end up as your right central midfielder, which is not just not somewhere you want to have Martinelli. Martinelli is the only spot that I would play Martinelli in this setup if you're like dead set on using him is I would prefer play him maybe in that Ribery role like out where you've gotten because mm. he's I believe Martinelli's an okay finisher I, I can't I'm not f super familiar with his stats but that that left mid you ask to do the least amount of work for your team as far as like build up goes or defensive contributions 
And Martinelli, to me, feels like the most out-and-out player for that role, though I think Ribéry obviously is like pretty great for that role, like pretty, very well set up to do that. The other thing is I don't, I don't like Eusebio as a lone striker. I don't, I don't think he can do the job himself. Yeah, because I guess you have Drogba, don't you? You, you need somebody that is going to be able to stretch, which Eusebio can do. But having a player that is a bit of a, that you can play more direct to if you need to helps a ton. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And then he has Sawa as a right attacking midfielder. I have Sawa in the exact same role. And she goes, so what happens is Sawa goes like box to box kind of as like a right mid. And then when you get into the attacking third, she drifts inside. And because she's relentless plus, like she just goes for days and is really, really pretty great in that role. Uh, that was good. I think that will definitely help people. And I think the main thing is to remember that, that wide, whether you flip it or not, so the more defensive right mid or left mid needs to be a player who can defend and play in the middle uh, in that left centre mid, right centre mid combination with the true centre mid player. If you're thinking about it in terms of like, a, if you want like a comparison for the type of player you're thinking about there. Like if you look at what would be like a traditional three man midfield, the way it, like you might set it up on FIFA and you have one player that maybe is like your get forward type player. And you have one player that's your true stay back. The player that's in between those that kind of has to be able to go box to box, but is really like a great passer that you would like to be able to score goals, but they don't necessarily have to be able to score goals. Like that's the card you're looking for there. So Luka Modric, that Bruno Fernandes card, Joshua Kimmich's card. I think Patelis works. Mm -hmm. I think you'd probably be better off with Bonmati in that role because I think she's a little bit better defensively. That new Musa card, I think, might be interesting in that spot. Mm -hmm. You just you need a player that's going to be good at breaking lines yeah. with their passing ability. Yeah, totally. Makes a lot of sense. Right, let's take a break on that and we'll be back to get some gameplay tips from Alex after the break. Hello listeners, a quick reminder because it is the tail end of that giveaway which was started for Team of the Year. If you've been thinking about signing up to become a supporter, then it's a great time to do so because there are 12,000 FC points still to be won. Just search support for weekly and there's currently a free trial you can access for seven days. And after that, it's just three pounds a month and you get an extra podcast every single week. And there are loads of perks beyond that. Too. So just search support foot weekly in your preferred search engine. Right, let's jump back into this week's main feed pod. Hello and welcome back after the break. So let's get into some listener gameplay questions. TJ Wiz here asking how many times per game does a pass not go where you want slash it is intended? Not that it is intercepted or does not come off like you wanted, but it goes to an entirely different player or spot than you would have liked. It's an interesting one. It's making me think in my head, maybe this person has maybe not the right controller settings because you've got the option of either having early or late uh, pass receiver lock, it's called, or maybe it's just sort of where they're pointing. I'm not sure. Uh, Alex, do you have any ideas as to what might be going wrong? Because it's, I, I mean, I, I appreciate that does happen sometimes, but I wouldn't say it's something that I personally feel is happening often. So, so there's, there's two ways to look at this. You could start with settings. And as you said, pass receiver lock, you have animation start, power up, and then late. Late is default, if I remember correctly. And basically what it means is that when you press pass and you've said this is the power and this is where I'm aiming, if the player hasn't actually released the ball yet and you move your left analog stick as if you're getting ready to take the touch it then changes the direction of where the pass is actually aiming when you have it on late. If you have it on animation start, it means as soon as the player pulls back their leg, wherever you were aiming at that time is where that pass is locked in. And then if you have it on power up, it means just basically as soon as you press pass and wherever you're aiming, that's where it's locked in. Most people have it on late because you can basically like bail out of passes where say you're on the left mid and you're aiming to pass to your striker if you have it on late and you power up that pass and you're aiming to your striker, you could then move your left analog stick to the centre mid instead because now that pass to the striker isn't on in that half a second. So that could be the thing where basically you're trying to get ready to receive the ball and you're actually moving your left stick before the pass has even happened if you're on late. So what I'd recommend is aim your left stick where you want the pass to go and keep aiming there until you actually see the ball leave the player's foot. 
and that should fix, you know, that issue. Then there's the other way to look at it where I will be a little bit ruthless here, TJ Wiz, and, and you can take this out how, you know, it suits you best. But if you go and look at a pro player's game, how many of them get their passes wrong where it doesn't go to the player that they wanted it to, it overhits, underhits, or whatever it may be? It's very few. And the reason for that is the game 90% of the time doesn't lie. What power you select and where you aim is where that ball is going to go. There is a lot of muscle memory to knowing the right sort of power and aiming correctly obviously is a massive thing, but that's the approach that you have to take is go, okay, was I aiming where I wanted the ball to go? Was I facing within the radius of where I want the body position to be to play that pass in front? Oh, I'm talking... If you want to play a pass to your striker, but you're facing your own goal, doing a 180 degree no scope is obviously going to increase the chance of the pass being unsuccessful. So making sure that the body position is facing kind of in the radius of where you want to pass, you're putting the right sort of power on. One bar of power is for someone that's very, very close to you. Two bars in that middle radius and then three bars, obviously a little bit further. And then four is just a big switch, basically. Approach you can take is that if you are, say, sat with your centre mid and there's only one player in front of you and it's your striker, I'd rather you overpower it than underpower it if you're doing a ground pass. Because basically, because there's no one else in front of them, the game will just lock it onto them anyway. One thing that I recommend is going into the trainer, turning the trainer on so you can see the trajectory of your pass. And what you'll notice is that the passing mechanic actually has like a, a lock-on mechanic where regardless of your power or aiming, if there's no one else within that vicinity, it will lock onto them. And when you kind of get that idea, it can really open up actually how the passing mechanic works and help you understand it. So try and take the approach of you must be doing something wrong rather than the game is out there to, you know, screw you over. Because it's not at the end of the day. It's going off your input and we just have to make sure that our input is right. Now, sometimes it can be difficult to get a pass to a certain player because there's someone else in the same sort of radius, the same sort of direction, the same sort of power, and that's where it can be a little bit more difficult. I would totally echo most of that. And I'll come on to examples of where that is most obvious. And I think an extra bit that can help you rationalize what's just happened the first thing I'll say is, it happens to me maybe once per game, maybe a little bit less, but only ever in a certain situation. And that's when I'm passing and there are two players that are near each other, but one of them is offside because it will always lock on to the offside player. And if it's been in the game for a long period of time, weirdly, it's also in Pez and, and was in Pez from about like Pez 16 to 21 before it became eFootball, where there is a weird thing in the game that locks passes onto offside players. So if you're making a forward pass and one of your players is offside, be extra like conservative about where you're aiming the pass. I would sooner aim it, you know, if, if you've got a striker ahead of you and a winger to the right, I'd sooner aim it so that the mistake would go to your right back rather than the mistake being the striker, because the, I feel like your margin for error is so small because of how much it prefers to pass to an offside player. That's the only place where I feel like the game doesn't listen to my input. I watch a lot of Nepenthes' gameplay, and if you've ever watched any of his gameplay, you'll know he complains an awful lot about his passes not going where he wants, and he has his controller on the screen. And when editing, I do like to just go back and see where was his analog stick aiming. And actually, most of the time, the pass has got exactly where his analog stick was aiming. And if you do that, if you go into your settings and add your controller onto the screen, and you ever feel like that pass didn't go where I was aiming, it's so much more informative to just record the last 30 seconds and after the game, go and watch it. Go and see where your how your how your analog stick moved as you were playing the pass because that uh, most people are on late lock because they haven't changed that setting and a lot of people will change into the direction they want to receive the ball before the pass has been released especially in like short pa short quick passing scenarios so it's it's absolutely something i would totally totally agree with alex here Blame yourself before the game on it from the majority of things and you'll become a better player. I think kind of changing tacks a little bit, and this is kind of in a passing sense, but also just because you were talking about crossing, and I know we had a question about this from Skodriska, um, about the fact that heading is manual 
You say you're using a lot of L1 square crosses. Am I right in assuming you're doing knockdowns off those rather than shooting? Do you have any like tips for knockdowns and like shooting with headers? Yeah, so he heading is completely manual. So just think of it like a power shot. And again, where you aim is where the ball goes. So if you are aiming, let's say, on target and the ball goes over, then with, there's only one solution. You put too much power on it for where you were. Power is how much power you're putting behind it. And if it's going over, it's because you've put too much if it's going wide, then you go, okay, my left analog stick was pointing in the wrong direction. But then there is the extra thing to add on to that, which is where it gets really interesting and it's so hard to fully say. is like, you obviously have stats like heading accuracy. If someone has 70 heading accuracy and you were aiming on target and you did the right power and it just goes wide of the post, then we can only put it down to the conclusion that the heading accuracy played the part there. So definitely looking at that and... Heading, as you you know, you said there that the L1 R1 header doesn't work anymore, and that's something that frustrated me. Where you used to be able to head it into the ground, you know, you think about a lot of headers in real life. A striker will head it into the ground to make it really difficult for the goalkeeper to get something on it. You can't do that anymore because when they introduced a power shot, that overrode that. I spoke to one of the devs at EA and they said they were going to add it back in for this year. Unfortunately, they never did. So you can't do that. Sometimes you will get the header into the ground just naturally with the power header trait by the looks of it, but I can't confirm that. So, so one thing to just, just really take away from, if it's going over, you've done too much power. If it's gone wide, you aimed incorrectly on the left analog stick. Again, clipping it, looking it back, and always trying to just come up with a solution on why it did that. So that could be something that helps massively. Yeah, I agree with both of you about um, recording gameplay with that controller overlay is just so big for learning things that you might have not realized you were doing wrong, um, correcting particular issues you've been having. Um, one thing I was going to say on the, the downward header, which is really effective, or used to be when you had the old buttons that you could use. I think you can still do it, but you just have to underpower it, basically. And anything below, I think it's like, I don't know, 50% or 30% power does do a downward header, but it, it's just so much less effective than it used to be. It's, yeah, it, it's anything from 40% or less, technically, is telling the game, put this along the ground, right? Yeah. But that, that solution when a header is just so rubbish that you can only really do that if someone has the power header trait yeah if they have aerial and no power header trait and then you try to do a downward header by just doing like one bar of power it's just the most pathetic header ever so mm. yeah it, it definitely is a little bit frustrating that it isn't as reliable as it used to be yeah do you find that power header is almost a must for scoring because i really really cannot score headers well i will score some but it, the percentage scored just goes down so much when the player doesn't have power header and i don't know if that's something that i can do myself maybe i should be trying to time them because i don't tend to time them but it, it just feels like without power head i'm kind of struggling i think it's a correlation with every play style really mm. where if you don't have finesse shot plus it's much difficult to score yeah. finesse shots if you don't have long ball pass plus it's much more difficult to play over the tops like the game very much at the minute is on a level of they have to have that play style plus or play style minimum for it to be reliable enough for you to look to execute that time and time again can you still score headers without power header? Yes, it just isn't as consistent. Yeah. One of the biggest factors of whether or not I'm going to score a header is, well, one, I, I like aerial. Not all aerial players have power header, but I think it allows you to get like cleaner headers off, if that makes sense. Yeah. And then second, I think it, the, the cross that I choose has a much bigger impact than the actual like heading usually for me. Mm. I can score a header with somebody that doesn't have power header if the player has like whipped cross, I guess, which falls mm. into the the play style thing again. But like if I choose a good crossing opportunity, I feel like I'm way more likely to score a header. Yeah, and I think that's something as well where people need to understand with cross is that it's very much about the cross you put in and the runner in the box having the chance to run at it and attack the ball. Yeah. Well, as in real life at times, sometimes you watch football they just kind of punt it into the box when someone's just kind of stood still and it's like, oh, well, because he's a, you know, he's a big striker and he's got that physical presence, they can almost make something happen out of it. While it's on the game, I don't really think you get that. So the attacker needs to be slightly ahead of the crosser if you're going for a whipped cross or if you're then going for the L1 square, it's more so about isolating up a, a good matchup. So Lukaku versus Batch or a bat post, for example. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a really good point. And uh, let me move us on to this. A final question here, which is from Joe DW. He says, has anyone used Swerve Pass this year? It's on the incisive Pass Plus as a perk, but never heard it mentioned really, and in what situations it might be used. So is this something that 
you would use Alex at all? Have you used the Swerve Pass? Uh, I'm right in thinking you have to trigger it as well with LT. Yeah, so it wasn't something that I used originally at the start of the year. And then one of my viewers uh, on Twitch said, Alex, have you tried them? I find them really good. One of the areas where I used to find through balls really frustrating. Imagine you're running down the wing and you're trying to play a through ball just past the centre back, slightly in front and going through that gap into the striker. So going round them and then you, you know, trying mm. to get in on goal. I always found them them sort of through balls just don't work. In real life, it's a through ball you would go for. You know, get a little bit of whip and just go around the centre back. Trying them don't work. And then uh, DB, his name was, was one that recommend trying them. And it's where you hold L2 uh, when someone has the incisive pass and you end up doing what it's called a swerve on demand pass. And you're basically saying to the game, yep, yeah, get this little bit of curl on it and just send it around. And they can be so beautiful to do. And a lot of people who listen be going, L2, uh, LT, well, that overlaps, you know, that's the flare button. And it's also the Travella button. Basically, it's about body position. If you're facing, say, 130 degrees to where you want to aim and pass the ball, you'll end up doing like a flare pass, so like, um, you know, back heel or something like that. If the player obviously has flare, it makes it even better. Well, it makes it even worse to do it. Um, and then if you're lining up where basically the Traveller angle would go, you know, where they're going to play it. So if you're playing a right-footed pass and look to the outside of the boot, then they'd go for that Traveller instead. So you have to make sure it's right. My advice would be basically aim your chest roughly where you want that pass to start going into and then you'll side foot the ball and you'll get that swerve on demand. You can also get it where if a player does have Travella and you go for a Travella and you hold L2 where they can do a swerve on demand plus the Travella as well but that's kind of you know how they work and yeah they are super good. L2 triangle round the defenders and definitely something for people to kind of kind of give a go on. Just on incisive pass, it's something I've noticed recently and I don't think it happened. It, maybe it was the patch, but um, I've got a few players with incisive playstyle plus and it's triggering on over the top through balls for me. Mm. And I don't think it used to. And it's doing the same job that like long ball pass does only for the for the lofted through balls. But I'm getting some kind of like crazy animations where the, the same thing with long ball pass where it like kills the defender but just with a through ball instead. I'm also getting insane height on lofted through balls. And because the defender can't really like move to block it, I'm doing a lot of volleyed power shots off chip through balls. And it's a lot of fun right now. Yeah, I, I think it has been the, a thing for a little while, actually, at least because ever since I've had that Olga Carmona, who I put through Pep's Legacy, who has incisive plus, I've been playing those kind of passes and it does seem like it is affecting those passes and it flashes up and things. So yeah, I think it's good. And yeah, I think being able to swerve those passes in behind, especially if you're in like the full back position, it's nice. I don't, the swerve passes are so unreliable. How do you mean unreliable? They're just not reaching the, the target or? They just like don't, like at least for me, they don't seem to swerve like th always the way I would want them to swerve. Mm. Not not just the way I would want them to swerve, but they like go too far, or I don't know. I'm I'm just not I'm not a believer in that play style or that mechanic as being a reliable way. Actually, one thing we didn't mention is: uh, would you use threaded button to do that? Yeah, that's what I'm using. Japes, try doing them without the R1 because as soon as you're adding that R1 button, you're doing the precision passes essentially, which makes them a lot more manual. They're more difficult to kind of get mm. off. So just L2 triangle you get that semi-assistance from the game and you might have a lot more success with them if you try that. It's just L2 triangle. L2 triangle, yeah. Interesting. All right. One thing I would try, I, I, I don't know whether people have tried this, but LT, L1, and R1 all together, I think does do a threaded swerve pass, mm. which can work quite nicely. So I know the R1 button is precision pass, but I don't. for some reason I don't think it actually does do a precision pass when you hold those three down. Like I don't tend to use precision pass on the ground and haven't found that it's doing that with that. A combination so I think that can work quite nicely just threading into the wide areas um, and sometimes yeah they'll, they'll put that uh, outside foot spit on it which is quite nice anyway uh, final important question probably the most important question we will ask uh, to end this podcast uh, this comes in from Bert Sacken he says uh, was wondering from some of the better players on the podcast when is the best time to deploy the gritty and how do I do it <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, never, never. <laughs> if your mind's on when to use the gritty, you've already lost. <laughs> uh, I actually don't know how to do the gritty, but uh, yeah, if anyone would like to expose themselves, then I've got, I've got, I've got a R2, slightly right analog stick up. up. I've got a, a slightly alternative viewpoint of it. Oh yeah, always, <laughs> always. 
<laughs> nice. Spoken like a true 11 winner. <laughs> yes. We take our advantages wherever we can get them. If you're riled up because I've griddied, then I'm going to be in an advantage in the game. So it is what it is. Are you, Alex, also uh, happy to do the s housery in terms of celebrations? Or? Normally, I just do a random celebration to have a little you know, glass of water and read the chat, whatever it may be. I'll do a gritty when I want to start a war. When I know <laughs> we're in for a sweaty game and I want to go all the way. It, basically, I use it as motivation for myself because if you're the one to do the gritty, you basically have to win that game otherwise you look like an idiot. So if, if you really want to pump yourself up, then yeah, you can deploy it. Other than that, just normal celebrations will do. And in fact, Alex, if people are looking how to do things, not necessarily the gritty, but they could check out your, your YouTube channel, your content, plenty of informative tips for people. Yeah, if you need any sort of help with, with anything on the game, we've pretty much got it covered. Head to YouTube or just come on over to Twitch and ask questions directly. Yeah, nice. And that is Alex B-E-E, -E, correct? That is it. Alex B for the buzzing B. Nice. And uh, thank you very much, Alex, for, for coming on the podcast. It's been a pleasure to have you. Thank you for having me on, as always. Yeah, pleasure. And finally then, to Josh as well, thank you very much for joining us on this Gameplay Podcast. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm off to uh, do some whippy whippies and feel peached. <laughs> Fantastic. And uh, of course, the man behind a lot of that, Japes, it's been good to have you on. Glad to see you're still influencing people from beyond the content creation scene. Yeah, I mean, hey, I learned something new today. Maybe I can <laughs> incorporate through balls or maybe I can make use of incisive pass because yeah, that yeah. is, for the longest time, my belief was that was kind of one of the most useless play styles that you could possibly have. But maybe it's not. <laughs> yeah. And maybe... Like, maybe you can actually tell the difference. I don't know. Mm. I'm, I'm eager to try it. Yeah, it's satisfying if you get some of those uh, swerved through passes going. Uh, but on that, thank you very much for joining us, listeners. Remember, you can catch this podcast via all the different podcast platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Uh, you might be listening on YouTube. If you are, drop a like, leave a comment. It definitely helps the pod out. And of course, if you'd like extra podcast content, then you can head over to Patreon. Just search support for weekly you can get an extra podcast a bunch of other perks too all for just three pounds a month and initially there's a free trial so yeah as i said just search support for weekly thank you very much for supporting if you are a supporter and a big thank you too to those icon patrons dave b hugh j darren w alistair m don p rob p jeff b david h tom b adam g neil p alex m jake s Dan W, Roger D, Lee A, Andrew C, Nishant, Waterman, Dylan H, Adam R, Rob L, Brendan W, Michael K, David G, Jimmy K, John D, Michael B, Aditya S, and Joshua K. Plus a special thanks to Luke M, Dave B, Hugh J, Tom M, Darren W, and Pato Foot for advice and production assistance. Before I leave you, just one more thing to add though. Ultimate Team is a bit like life really, it has its many ups and downs. If you're having a few more downs than ups in real life in these more difficult times, then please don't feel that you're alone or need to struggle on without taking action. If you go to thecalmzone.net, there's loads of resources, advice, support, or even just a friendly chat for anyone who needs it. If it sounds like it could help you, then head over to thecalmzone.net. And for now, have a good one, and I'll catch you on the next podcast.